Okay, uh, uh, welcome to the second of uh, Samir's lectures on supersymmetric black holes, indices, and uh, n equal to four super young nerves. So, uh, what you okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll just start without an introduction. So, yesterday there was some confusion about this two parameter reduction. So, I thought I'll begin with this, but I just want to check if Suvrat is around. If not, I'll, I can do this later. Or... I'm around online, Samir. Then I'll do this. Uh, so, sorry, can you hear me, Samir? No, yeah, thanks. And then I will do it. If you're around, I'll, I'll go Fine. through. It. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so this is this. I'll go at a fast pace because it's just, I just wanted to clarify some things. Um, so the statement is that there's a two parameter reduction for supersymmetric black holes. Uh, and this is a universal statement. Just wanted to say it like that. It holds for, for ADS 7 six, five, four, and three, and R4 and R5, all in Lorentzian signature. Um, all of these admit supersymmetric black holes. These are the cases um, that we know, and, and this statement is completely universal. So I don't know for universal proof, but case by case, it's true. So I'm just going to run through it very quickly. Um, so let's start with R13, R4, which is, I think most people already know. So R4 means that you have um, an S2 uh, transfer symmetry. So that's an SU2 symmetry. I'm going to call it J tilde for reasons you'll see soon. And there's one gauge field. So this is a Kerr Newman solution with three charges. The generic black hole has three charges, mass, charge, and angular momentum. And uh, another thing I wanted to clarify, uh, this is an apology from on my behalf. Uh, yesterday I used the word regularity in two contexts as was uh, clarified, but I just want to say it again. One is, Lorentzian regularity. So this is what when you write black hole solutions, you want to make sure that there's no singularity outside the horizon or no closed time like curves. Um, but I also use the word regularity for Euclidean regularity. That just means smoothness. So I hope today, at least by the context, it's, it's clear. Okay, there's a bit of confusion, but that's fine. Okay, so this uh, regularity condition usually is an inequality. There's some function of m, q, and j. Yesterday, I wrote it explicitly, which is greater than or equal to zero. And the equal, the saturation of that inequality is the extremality condition, okay? Uh, and then on top, if you impose supersymmetry, already assuming regularity, means that it's, you're already extremal, then you have a two parameter reduction. So M equals Q and J tilde equal to zero. Okay, this is the case, I think most people, it's kind of a textbook example, okay? So this is another way to say this is four dimensional, if you take ungauged supergravity, just asymptotic flat space, Supersymmetric black holes do not rotate. Okay, so that's a statement I think we should be familiar. Now let's do R5. So, I mean, uh, yes. So, when you say this uh, supersymmetric black hole, it can be embedded in a supersymmetric theory which preserves some fraction of the supercharge. Right? That's right. So, yeah, by supersymmetric black hole, I mean that this, yeah, so that's the bosonic solution. Uh, this theory with, with metric plus one gauge field is you can supersymmetrize it and the black hole is uh, preserves some fraction of supercharge. Exactly. Thank you very much. Now let's do uh, R5. So now we have an S3. So we have an SU2 times SU2. I'm going to call the charges JJ tilde. And then this mass and ch uh, electric charge. Okay, this is the Myers Perry solution. Again, asymptotically flat. Again, the extremality condition is some function. It's not the same F uh, of these four charges equal to zero. And supersymmetry again implies two conditions mass equal to charge and J tilde equal to zero. Okay, that's the BMPV solution. This also should be familiar to many strain theorists. Okay. Now let's go to ADS. No, I'm just talking about black holes with with a horizon. Let's. I mean, there's a whole. We can discuss this for half an hour, but I just wanted to clarify yesterday's. Uh, yeah, topology is good. exactly. It's 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 just a sphere. So I mean, there are other things you can. I, I'm. I don't want to discuss magnetic charges because again, there's a. You know, the killing spinner condition is different there. It's a supersymmetric condition. So let's just stick to electric rotating black holes in various dimensions. Uh, but now let's do ADS. So this is gauge supergravity. So yesterday we did ADS five. So this has an SU two times SU two. This is J and J tilde and a, and a gauge field U one. Uh, so again, there are four charges. There's one extremality condition, and there's, there's another supersymmetry condition, which which is which I call G. So this F and G are the functions you saw yesterday. So there was a, a diagram of this type. Um, the, that was extremality, and that was supersymmetry. Okay, so this I won't write out. Yesterday we already, already wrote it, and the black hole lives here at the intersection. So there's a two parameter reduction. So the, the one technical difference between ADS and, and, and 
uh, flat space is that this equation is a little bit more um, intricate. It's just, it's, it's, it's more nonlinear. Here, there's something simple. Now, let's do ADS four, five, uh, excuse me. Yeah, ADS four, ADS six, and ADS seven. So that was ADS five. Um, exactly the same phenomenon happens. Uh, I won't work it out. Kassani, Dagde Kassani and his student Papini uh, have worked out all the details. You can look at this paper. It's, it's the statements are precisely the same. The number of charges vary a little bit according to the case group, okay, according to the rotation group. Uh, I do want to do ADS3 because that's what caused the confusion. So ADS3, let's start with ADS3 times S2. That's the smallest supersymmetric theory you can do. So this has a 0, 0,4 two-dimensional superconformed field theory algebra. Okay, so that's uh, you can either derive this from ADS or from the dual CFT. So that's ADS three, and this has a Hamiltonian and a rotation inside ADS three, which yesterday we were calling J. Today I'll call it L, uh, and H plus L and H minus L are the usual L naught and L naught bar. Okay, of the CFT, and then there's an S two, so there's an SU two rotation that I'll call J tilde. Okay, and from the point of view of uh, the ADS3 theory, suppose like yesterday we were only studying five dimensional theory. If you study only the three dimensional theory, that's a U1 gauge field. Okay, so it's just that the notation is somehow standard in each context, but the notations don't agree. So this one is called J or J tilde, and the three charges are L0, L0 bar, and J tilde. All right? This is the minimal supersymmetric black hole, I'm saying. And the supersymmetric black hole is L0 tilde equal to zero and J tilde equal to zero. Okay, note that if I reduce this ADS, imagine this ADS3 to be the near horizon of a black string in string theory, and then you reduce it like that to a black hole by, by taking appropriate scaling of parameters. So that ADS3 becomes ADS2, then this solution becomes ADS2 times S2 with these charges, and that's precisely the near horizon of the supersymmetric Kerr Newman solution that I discussed, the first example that I just showed. Okay, now. The last example is ADS3 times S3. Uh, here, you have the same L0 and L0 bar coming from ADS3. And I have an S3, so you have a J and a J tilde. That's that. And again, from the point of view of, AD, from the point of, view of a pure three-dimensional theory on ADS3, there are two external gauge fields. It's not minimal supergap. Okay. And yesterday, I, I mean, I should have called this R and R tilde, but J and J tilde are standard notation. Okay, now the algebra is 4 comma 4 superconform field theory. And the supersymmetric black hole condition is L0 tilde equal to zero and J0 tilde, J tilde equal to zero. Okay, so in each case, there is a, is a two parameter reduction. Okay. Uh, so, 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 sorry, Samir, why, uh, this is the, con but this is not the supersymmetric condition is only L, L0 tilde equal to zero. So can you repeat, this is not the supersymmetric one? Uh, if you just impose the condition for supersymmetry in the Ramon Ramon sector, that's just L0 tilde is equal to zero. Condition for supersymmetry on what? If you just impose that the state is BPS. No, I'm not talking about states. So these are black hole solutions in supergravity. States I we'll discuss that. today. Yeah, is it is it in, is it intuitively clear why there can't be black holes which have J tilde not equal to zero? I mean, is there some is it obvious that such black holes can't exist? So one thing I can say is if you look at, let, let me just say one more thing and uh, wait, let me say this thing first and then I'll say one more thing. So first let, let's just repeat what you just said, namely that if you ask for a state being annihilated by, by the supersymmetric condition, by the supercharge, you only get that. Okay. So I have a, so this is like a left move. This is left and this is right. Okay. And this is the, uh, sorry, I should have said this. This example is precisely the near horizon, where did that go, of the BMPV black hole. Okay, this is a Strominger Waffe example. So there's a left and a right moving sector of the CFT, and the right movers in the ground state, and the left movers are somewhere there. So that's non supersymmetric, that is supersymmetric. But the right movers can also be, there's a, there's a large degeneracy of ground states in the Ramon sector. Okay, there's a Q1, Q5 if you, if you look at the D1, D5 P system. Okay, now, with a certain normalization, let's say the, uh, so J max, okay, suppose they go from minus J max to J max, so minus J max over two to J max over two. Okay, so J max is roughly Q1, Q5. Okay, these are the degeneracy of states. What you'll find is that the, the states, the, the statistics of states 
looks like this. It looks like this. So this is J and this is minus J max. It looks something like this. Okay. So they peaked at zero. Okay. So somehow super gravity is seeing an average value. Okay. That's one way to understand. That's the best intuition I have. And well, there's one more thing. There's one more thing I want to say here. And then if it's not the same thing, then, then please correct. Um, it's the, it's the fact that all of these facts about supersymmetric black holes are perfectly consistent with the most general index in each case. So I haven't studied this. I haven't, sorry, discussed this yesterday. That's what I'm going to do today for ADS five, but let's do it for ADS three. Okay, so for ADS three, the index that counts these states are the, is the elliptic genus. You put the right movers in the ground state and uh, put the left movers to some whatever state you want. And then the, what is the elliptic genus? That's the index of a certain supercharge in the right moving sector. The one that you impose, sorry, this should have been Q tilde. All right. And so this index is a trace of minus one to the F, Q to the L naught, Q bar to the L naught bar, but because there's no, because the right movers in the ground states, the L naught bar dependence, uh, sorry, it should be one, uh, goes away. And then we put some uh, e to the two pi z times j, okay, some chemical potential. You're not allowed to put a chemical potential with j tilde because it does not commute with supersymmetry. Okay, so because of this, if you have a free theory, you can just check that there's explicit cancellations. That roughly speaking, what is happening is that these, these things cancel and then there's some delta function that remains. Okay. Ashok, please. Can, can you just press that? Yeah, what I say, I mean, this is essentially, I mean, one of the reasons why you argue that the index and degenerates the knowledge. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. Everything else gets lifted and somehow only that one single angular momentum. Is. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, 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 sorry, I mean, maybe you'll say this, Samir, but this is a, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting thing, right? Because in principle, supergravity could have seen more. I mean, you're right. Maybe there's some average and things are peaked and it only sees something, but in principle, there are more states uh, in the gravity side and on the DCFT side, which you would like to match, but. No, so that's exactly. So I don't know if you could hear Ashok's comment. So you can make this more precise by looking at the near horizon ADS2. All right. Um, and basically, if you use ideas of ADS2 CFT1, I mean, you don't need, even need that. You can essentially show that trace minus F minus one to the F equals trace one. And therefore, you can show that the, maybe you're familiar with it. If you want, I can go through the argument. But if you, if you know that this is true, then essentially it means because minus one to the F is the same as minus one to the J, Right. It means that on the app, so first you, okay, so let me back up. So we know that on the average, the black hole doesn't rotate. Okay. That's J equal to zero. This is J tilde. Um, then we know that in the ADS2, there's a micro canonical ensemble. Okay. Unlike ADS3 and higher, this is the near horizon of the black hole I'm talking about. And if you combine these two facts that on, the, on an average, there's no rotation and the fact that you're in the micro canonical ensemble means all states in the ensemble have the same charge. It means no state has rotation and therefore all the states are bosons. Okay. So that's, that's what Ashok had just commented. So you can make this more precise. Um, Fast balls do rotate. That's right. So, that's right. so, so they don't have ADS to uh, symmetry. Exactly. So there are certainly solutions in supergravity, which have this, this, the statement I made yesterday, I think I hope I was clear enough. It was about supersymmetric black hole solutions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, another way to ask uh, this is, is there an analog of that Lorentzian regularity condition, which uh, you got to, to uh, the, the reduction by two, one from the supersymmetry condition and one from the Lorentzian regularity condition. But is there an analog of that uh, in ADS, in these ADS black holes? Uh, the Lorentzian uh, regularity condition, yes, definitely. So that, that's that's exactly what I was saying yesterday. So it's uh, true for uh, uh, ADS three for uh, the so all of these. So that was that was what I tried to do. So all of these conditions. So I started with flat space, but the same arguments you can do for R five, ADS four, five, six, seven. 
So uh, I see. So, so that is for even the ADS three case. So that's so in some sense the supergravity states are not. Uh, I mean the ones which this uh, the we the analog of supersymmetric states which. Uh, um, uh, uh, what Subhat was asking, the ones, uh, those would not be uh, regular states. No, no, I, I, that I think one has to be careful. You have to distinguish states and black holes. Hmm. I think the statement you want to make is that those states do not form the black hole. Okay. There might be such solutions, but the black hole is not made up of such. Those states. They are perfectly fine states. There's nothing hmm. wrong with those states. Hmm. There are supergravity solutions which do rotate. Like uh, these fuzzballs the fuzz or something. Yeah. Um, all right, or, or maybe more precisely, they don't dominate the black. So, well, that depends on 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 the details. So, there's one example where there are as many, you know, like the the famous first ball example where the just two charge system Q1 Q5. There's a in some, I mean, there's a whole discussion which Ashok should lead. But you know, in a certain duality frame, you have a black hole. In another duality frame, you have as many of those rotating states as account for the entropy of a black hole. There's no known example, at least to me, where one is, that is more, but this, in that case, it's exactly the same. So, yeah. Maybe I can also yeah, please. add that, I mean, typically the, the index doesn't protect this individual uh, jets. No, exactly. The index protects only the average. The average right? Right. And, uh, most likely what uh, happens is that by the time it has become black holes. Yeah. Right? There's only one kind of angle. Exactly, exactly. So, so that was exactly this comment. So here the index, you cannot, you're not allowed to put this in. And, and that's true for all of these examples that are shown. Today I'll, I'll show ADS5. Okay. So, so now the index is like the black hole rather than, yeah. in, in the index counts the black. The, the message I want to give is that, so in my title, I did not say supersymmetric states, but so there was the supersymmetric black holes and the supersymmetric index, and they're very close to each other. That's that's the message I want you. Okay, then I'll move on. Uh, I mean, I'll start. <laughs> um, so, okay, so today I'll be slightly faster, but uh, still not very fast. And then the third lecture, I'll, I'll like to go a little faster. Um, as always, stop me. So first, a brief recap. Uh, so sorry, Suvrat, is that all okay? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. Good. So yesterday we said that um, we started from the gravity. There is S three times S one, and there was a chemical potential. This was the electric chemical potential, and there are two chemical potentials for angular momentum. And there's this black hole here in the interior. Um, and then uh, we said that if you look at the boundary of that, that's what defines the supersymmetric field theory. So the boundary is the same S3 times S1. There's no interior with these potentials. Uh, there's also beta, of course, which is the, the size of the circle. And yesterday we analyzed this side of the story. And we said, so we know that on general grounds, this partition function is a sum over saddles. And we analyzed, so the ADS5 saddle is kind of trivial. And we analyzed the black hole saddle. The black hole saddle, um, the black hole itself had the supersymmetric black hole was um, specified by three charges, J1, J2, and R. And the dual chemical potentials were omega 1, omega 2, and phi. And the black hole free energy was a, a constant times 1 over G Newton times phi cubed over omega 1, omega 2. Okay, this is what we derived yesterday, where these three potentials are not free, they're constrained by this linear constraint, omega one plus omega two minus two phi is minus two pi i. I stuck in a minus sign compared to yesterday, if anybody know this, um, that's, this actually a, a symmetry of this theory allows me to do it. Um, I didn't, somehow the conventions are such that in the field theory, this is more natural, the gravity. I, I haven't, I didn't manage to iron it out uh, last night. Okay, so I just uh, kept a minus sign here. Okay, somebody can I just yeah, ask a, of course. some more questions? So, in the in flat space, of course, the relations are very simple. So you know that all black holes have the same. Yeah. Same yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. In the in ADS, right? You said that there are complicated set of relations between the charge and the charge. yeah. I mean some nonlinear relation. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. calculate the index. Mm -hmm. As you take it on phase right? Yeah. And calculate the index. Yeah. Does it always have the same sign? Does the sign of the index become independent of the parameters? As you're getting the charges or the angular momentum. Ah, no, no, no. So that's exactly, so that's a, 
I, I don't want to I, I don't want to answer in one line. It's a subtle. The answer is subtle, and the answer is no. And and I want to discuss that today. It's it's a very uh, interesting phenomenon. So it's it's not like how it happens in flat space. Yeah. All right. Okay. So yeah, I want to sort of work my way towards that. Okay. So now I'm going to change variables. Omega one is two pi i sigma. Omega two is two pi i tau. And so this free energy black hole free energy is some constant times n square. So pi i over twenty seven n square times a cubic divided by a quadratic function. And notice that this cubic starts with one. So when sigma and tau go to zero, there's a singularity which is one over sigma tau. Okay, just just keep that in mind. All right. Uh, now what happens on this side? Uh, again, I did something. I, I, I not not quite incorrect, but I, I didn't. So a small gap in logic here, which is yesterday we showed that the black hole saddle is independent of. So a priori this is dependent on beta. Yesterday we showed that the black hole saddle is actually independent. Free energy is independent of beta in these variables. Um, but in fact, so so I also sort of just without discussing it too much, I just didn't put a beta here. A saddle by saddle, what of all the saddles we know we can show it. It should be a consequence of supersymmetry. But again, the best I know how to do is you write some solution and analyze fluctuations, and each time that's that's good. On this side, uh, again, a priori there is a beta dependence, and the the question is, how does this go away? It should. And uh, another, I mean, even more basic question is: this should be a trace, like we said yesterday. Okay, yesterday we wrote down the functional integral interpretation. This should be a trace. The question is a trace of what? Okay, I want to make this more precise. All right. So let's go there, unless there are questions. Uh, I mean, you uh, you said saddle by saddle, but you you, you talked about only the Suzy black hole saddle. Yesterday, I only talked about Suzy saddle. Uh, and but you're saying that even for other solutions that yeah, are there, yeah, and these Friday, I'll discuss a little bit. Uh, and there again, it's independent. Yeah, yeah. Of I mean, it's not a surprise. It's 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 it should be. A, it's a consequence of supersymmetry. Mm. But again, unlike so in the field theory, there's a very simple algebraic argument which just shows the independence. Here, it has to be done analytically. That you write down some smooth solution and analyze perturbations and show that the beta dependence goes away. Yeah, or you can do an asymptotic analysis. That if you know. There's an asymptotic ADS five, and you can do it in that region, independent of what goes on. Okay. So now, yeah. So if it's independent of beta, that means uh, it's independent of temperature. So uh, if you take, uh, how do you get the entropy? Because in, in order to get the entropy, you have to take a derivative with respect to beta or something with respect to the. But that's exactly what I discussed yesterday, right? So entropy. So, so zero temperature system statistical systems can also have entropy. There's a symmetry which protects it, which is supersymmetry. The so lot, lot of states at the same. There's a degeneracy of states, and the variation of principle we discussed. That's that was the whole lecture of yesterday. That instead of varying with respect to beta, you vary with respect to the other chemical potentials. See, uh, see, it's one thing to say that it's at zero temperature, and another thing to say that it's independent of temperature altogether. Right? Yes. So, if it's independent of temperature altogether, then how do you get any thermodynamics? Because okay, why don't why don't you ask me after the lecture, and I can go back to yesterday's lecture and show you how how this works. Okay, all right. Or if you, I mean, this should be. Is it already online? Yeah. So, if you want, you can just look at look at my notes online, and then ask me a question again. I'm happy to do it. So, but isn't it clear right. from the formula? If you focus on h equal to zero, then it's independent of beta, right? You just take this expression and focus on states which have h equal to zero. It doesn't have any dependence on beta. No, he was asking about the the gravity. Right, right, right. But I mean, I thought the question was how, why it's independent of temperature, isn't that I mean, on the gravitational side? I, I didn't quite understand the question, but wh why don't we? I mean, fine. All of yesterday's lecture was was that. So so let's uh, move on today. Today I want to discuss the field theory. Okay. Uh, so what are we calculating? So we start with this. Um, let me show you. Is this coming up? Yeah. Um, so yesterday we had this argument that this is the gravity solution. There's an S three times an S one and some smooth cigar like. Geometry and you impose smoothness or Euclidean regularity here, 
and follow the consequences and you get some boundary theory that boundary theory is s3 times s1 with these uh, with these uh, background fields and there's a killing spinner which becomes the killing spinner on the boundary that killing spinner is anti periodic around the time circle um, but it's still a supersymmetric background and here's the background okay it's it's s3 times s1 with a uh, you know a twist or a vibration as you want to see it um, of angular momentum and electric potential okay and the the thing you want to calculate is this supersymmetric partition function okay the twists arise the twists manifest themselves in the action um, either by by addition of these external uh, fields the external gauge field and the off diagonal components of the metric or you can just keep the usual action and and twist the fields themselves okay this is the this all completely standard so now the question is what's the hamiltonian interpretation of this okay so there is there are three chemical potentials there's uh, one coupling to j1 one coupling to j2 one coupling to r um and so you must have e to the minus beta h that's because so i'm just doing the feynman prescription so there's a path integral that becomes e to the minus beta h the fermions are anti periodic so there's no minus 1 to the f and then there are three external chemical potentials they couple to these charges so that should be the trace okay it's just standard field theory now remember that phi was had a constraint phi was determined in terms of the other two as such okay so you plug that in so you get this expression so now you still have e to the minus beta h but now sigma and tau times j1 plus r by 2 and j2 by r by 2 and then you have pi i r okay then you insert here by the spin statistics relation e to the 2 pi i j1 plus pi i f okay because yeah by the spin statistics which holds for any state in the yangness theory uh and then for now you get a minus 1 to the f and you have e to the 2 pi i j1 and e to the pi i r that combines into this expression and all you're doing all that happens is that sigma gets shifted by 1 okay so i don't know if i can show the whole thing there you go okay so the first line here is by oops i don't think i can do that so that's by the feynman prescription of uh, path integral to hamiltonian uh, that's the constraint and that's spin statistics and you just get this and this is precisely the super conformal index of a generic n equal to 1 super conformal field theory okay uh, sorry uh, the constraint from the point of view of the yang mills theory is that a no it's it's so you should really begin here from the yang mills theory you hmm. i mean you could just you know th this is so because you are looking at states that obey this constraint yeah you can always you can always no it's not even that you you can it's it's so start with so this is a yangels here okay now i'm just saying you can write this by just adding some fake phi to make it look like phi is just this to make it look like the gravitational answer that's all i'm saying right but uh, i mean it's not the most general chemical potential you could write in the yang mills theory in the yang mills theory in principle you could have written a partition function with you could have written partition function that, with that that and that so a priori this looks like the partition function yes the the gravity the boundary value of the gravity tells you that oh uh, so uh, uh, you, you no boundary well uh, here when, when no, you say uh, are you saying from the background that you put it on yeah uh, uh, here I this see. one okay so phi plus omega 1 whatever it was plus omega 2 something my equals right okay so it's because you put the yang mills theory yeah, this on this background you just literally do that and yeah all right uh and so you get this and this is precisely the super conformal index oh, of n equal to 1 so by ms there's another thing you can do you can start with this background okay Excuse and calculate me. this one second calculate this uh, functional integral with local using localization 
That's something you can do. Just you can just do it. You don't have to do any manipulations. It's a little uh, funny because you have to sort of rework it because the killing spinner is not periodic. Um, but basically, the whole localization formalism goes through. We did this in the first paper. Um, I should have said this. So this is you can can calculate. using localization, you have to sort of just make sure that all the things that are supposed to hold hold, like things are Q exact and so on. There's no reason why Q has to be a zero mode. It's a zero mode under the full Dirac operator. And then you can check that the answer is the same as that. Okay. Sorry, there was some question. I, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm a bit, yeah. So a very nice question. So why is this, is, is, can, you, can you explain this spin statistics statement? The spin statistic statement is uh, the fact that any state, the fermion number of any state uh, is the same as uh, e2 to, to pi i j1. It, it, it says that bosons carry integer angular momentum and fermions carry half integer angular momentum, which is a factor of field theory or quantum mechanics. See, but, okay. So any state in the Hilbert space, this operator evaluates to one. I see. So if we had started just from young means, right? Yeah. And you, you just defined a super compromise. Yeah. This is what you would have got, right? You would have got, uh, yeah, with some sigma and zero sigma. Yeah. 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 There, there will be no other trial. No, no. These are most general. That's exactly what I'm going to show you next. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So our goal is uh, to analyze this super conformal index and show that indeed there's a saddle point with this black hole free energy. Okay. So today I'll just completely switch to this point of view. Now I'll, I'm going to start again from, from zero and just work out the super conformal index and show that there is a saddle of this time. Okay, so you could have, I mean, effectively that's what happened chronologically, like different groups are doing different things. And you know, there was a little bit of an idea and then it all fits together beautifully. Uh, equivalently, you could go back to the microcanonical question. So this index has some Fourier expansion of this type. These are the degeneracy of states um, perhaps with a phase, uh, and you can analyze that and ask whether the log of that is the entropy. Okay, I'll do both. All right. Um, yeah, I'm certainly running behind time, but I'll just go Sorry, on. Sorry, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Like, how did the beta dependence go away? Could you please explain again? Yeah. So, in fact, that's what I'm going to do next. Um, so, you could you could have asked. Uh, so here the beta depend if the answer is uh, where did you mean i mean in the final answer uh, yes well, no no in, in, when you're comparing with the super gravity since the super gravity is beta independent as you as so you in super gravity the beta dependence went off yesterday already yeah okay? so, so 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 i mean it's, it's is, never there this yeah. has to match the super gravity calculation then yeah so that i'll show you that's exactly our goal today to to show that this super conformal index indeed will match it. Yeah. All right. So the context is. Uh, Sami, yeah. One question. So you'll be working in finite n on the CFT side. Finite n. n. Yeah. I'll start with finite. So I'll discuss this also in a bit of detail. Okay. That's also an important question. Uh, so I want to put everything on a computer. That's my uh, philosophy. So I, I will work at finite n. Then I'll try to take some larger. This is about when you say the saddle point, you, you said- I will discuss this in great detail what I mean by that. Yeah. Okay. This was indeed one of the confusions in the literature and yeah. Uh, so let me sort of quickly run through the basics because I mean, there are a lot of experts. I don't want you to get impatient, but- Saddle yeah. point will directly give the grand, uh, the, uh, micro canonical or the canonical? No, no, no. Saddle point is always canonical, grand canonical. Microcanonical is a set of numbers. These numbers, like I'm going to put n1, n2 equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 200, plot it and see if it agrees with the entropy. Yeah. So when you write this, this, that, yeah. I'll explain all this. So I've been deliberately vague so far. Today is when I'll make all of this very so precise. To begin with, on the gravity side, also you calculate the partition, right? That's here. Yeah. But even before that, I actually calculated the area of the black hole. Hmm. So that's this. Even so, yesterday what I did, so, so yes, that you mean this is not the microcanonical. It's the microcanonical. It's S is a function of the charges. 
So you have to go from there to S by some Legendre transform. From here to the gravity. So sorry, let me just clarify. So the first calculation that was ever done was this. This is area of the horizon divided by four. That's a micro canonical calculation. Okay. Right. The black hole is specified by some charges. You measure its area. Yeah. Well, it's also specified by chemical potential. So that, that's true. But in gravity, you can take both points of view. Let's just yeah. say that it's a so leading term. You can say it's exactly right. right. Yeah. Yesterday, what I did was to convert that into a grand canonical like object okay. and showed that the Lejeune transform gives you exactly this. Okay. So that was the yeah. gravity side. Today I'm saying you can do the same thing on both sides. Oh, sorry, for both ensembles. Okay. In gravity, somehow there's no difference at leading Earth. Hmm. Yeah. Right. But one of them is a function of the charges, the other one is a function of the chemical potential. Yeah. I'm saying in field theory, there is a big difference. I mean, you, you'll have to convert one to the other. In, in gravity, the conversion is just a Lejeune transform. In field theory, the conversion is a Laplace transform, there's a full quantum. Uh, transformation. So the saddle point approximation will break down. Somewhere. Yeah, here I can't do a saddle point. But on the other hand, this I can put on a computer. There are numbers. I can just follow it. Okay. So this is actually the most basic thing you can do to check such entropy problems. So Whenever you have entropy, the if you have if you can write down a microcanonical formula and put it on a computer, you should just do that and check. And this has to do with the fact that the index alternates in sign or uh, what has to do with this? The fact that the field theory side is not. Uh, I mean, it's sort of legendary Laplace are different. No, no, that I'm just saying that on a field theory, on a, I'm not saying that at fine, it's what you were saying, you know, on a computer, you do finite n. So that's why there's a difference. But in large n, yeah, but it, it, it not. So let me come to this, <laughs> these questions. Yeah, yeah. So this and this are indeed analytically related in some limit, which I don't want to say right now because then there'll be more questions. And I don't, yeah. Uh, but but there's no surprise. This field theory, what we will show is that I'll calculate this. This is a function, and these are numbers, these are integers. Okay, and I'll do two things. First is check this on a computer, and secondly, check this analytically. And thirdly, I'll show that this follows from this by some transformation. Yeah, so. Yeah, I will be able to accept the things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will give it a micro. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, you could do that. So that's it's there's nothing that's completely consistent with what I'm saying. You could you could you could just say at large charges. So why I'm hesitating with all this is is the the question of what is the limit we are taking. There's a large charge limit and the large n limit is not the same thing. That's why I don't want to commit to that. But Everything you're saying is perfectly correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So bear with me for 15 minutes, and we'll get there. All right. So now here's the context. This is again very basic. So the context is supersymmetric quantum mechanics with one set of charges. Maybe just to it bothers me. Um, suppose you fix, fix n, fix a theory, then there is no issue. Then this and this are indeed. Um, the usual Fourier transforms, which then you can do a, it, when n, the charges are large, you can convert that into a saddle point. So there's absolutely no issue. It, it's just the reason I write these two separately is because it's nice to see them. It's in some sense, it's easier to verify numerically. The like plotting functions is always. You have more errors than plotting numbers. So, yeah. All right. Um, so you have a complex supercharge Q, which uh, anti commutes Q Q bar, anti commutes to H, which is non negative definite, and HQ and HQ dagger commutator is zero. Okay. So this is the setup of the Witten index. And the representation come in two, two types one is massive representation or long or non BPS representations. Which are boson fermion pairs and equal and opposite, sorry, equal energy and opposite fermion number. Or you can have singlets or short or BPS representations, which come at zero energy and they, they can be either only bosons or only fermions. All right. So now you look at the Witten index. So there's a trace over the full Hilbert space of the theory of minus one to the F times e to the minus beta H. The first thing I want to say is that that's Z, whoops. And said, um, 
because it's a trace of the full Hilbert space, has a path integral representation. It's a perfectly well defined observable of the theory. Okay, it's not you're not taking some sector of states to define it. Then, because of the pairing, this is the usual argument, and because there's a minus one to the f, um, the beta dependence drops out. So there were some questions, and therefore um, the answer is just a the difference between the number of ground state bosons and ground state fermions. Okay, this b, e to the minus beta h does two jobs. Firstly, it defines the, the, the thing as a trace over the full Hilbert space, but also it, it ensures that this trace is, is convergent okay, at high energies. All right. Uh, and then for the same, by the same argument, if I deform the theory in a supersymmetric way, so Q and H both get deformed such that the algebra remains the same, then um, by the same argument, uh, there's no beta dependence, there's no H dependence, so you could even put a lambda here, and you can show there's no lambda dependence. Okay, so in particular, when there's a modulized space or something like this, this um, index is invariant on the modulized space. Okay, now more generally, uh, you can do the following. You can, in addition to the minus one to the f. So here, this z is just a number, right? Because the num it's the number of bosons minus the number of fermions. It's a bit boring, uh, so you can make it more interesting by inserting operators here. Which commute with the supercharge. All right. And that does many things for you. So firstly, it refines the problem. Okay. In the sense that the, this set of ground states now gets refined by some other charge. Um, <clears throat> and now you have a function. Okay. So you have more detail to study. All right. Um, I should have said that if so the, the fact that you impose this condition guarantees that the same arguments uh, go through. Okay, so it's still protected, it's invariant under deformations and so on. Okay, for that you need this condition to hold. Now, you, this setup applies to any supersymmetric quantum field theory in a compact space, like what we want to study on an S3. The reason is if you have an S3, you can think, Think of it as three times time, just dimensionally reduce on S3. You get some quantum mechanics, which is, you know, it's an infinite number of degrees of freedom, but formally this setup applies. Um, but now typically what you have is you have an infinite number of ground states. And uh, this refinement also plays the role of regulating that. So many times, if you do this for a <coughs> excuse me, quantum field theory, and you don't, you ask only for the Witten index, sometimes you get infinite. And so you refine it as much as possible, and that also helps you with the regulator. Okay, so that's the <clears throat> that's the observable will study. <clears throat> I have a question. Yeah, like uh, when you are computing the degeneracy of states of some black hole, then shouldn't you kind of fix the kind of the charges and the masses, and then compute? The number of ground states by computing some index uh, for, for, for that particular set of charges and masses, right? You can do that by computing some index, but you have to fix the charges and masses to some specific value. So I'm not sure why this particular index is doing that. Uh, I haven't said it, it is yet. In fact, this is a very general formalism. I'm still setting up this formalism. Once I tell you what will Calculate it. You can ask your question again if you're still confused about it. We're not there yet. Okay, so just be a little more patient. Um, yeah. Are some? Yeah, there is some charge like this. This oh, these are some operators which commute with super so the supersymmetry of the type that that we were putting, like R charge or spin or something like that. I know because of the mu. I'm just saying, imagine you had a set of ground states labeled by one charge, okay, Q, uh, R, let's say, okay, and for every R, suppose you had a, ha, have a BPS state, and let's say all of them are bosons. If you ask for what's the Witten index, one plus one plus one plus one, which is infinite. But now the answer is, it's one plus e to the minus mu plus e to the minus two mu, et cetera. You get a function, which is perfectly well defined. That's, that's the sense in which it's. Here, this mu is, is taken to be such that this, function is, is well defined. This, you take it in the 
either real or upper half plane such that this is converging. Yeah. No, no, no. Charges can be anything. Ah, bounded below. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, this will go both directions, and then it's yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't understand your question. Yes. Right, that's typically what happens in in our cases. Okay. Now uh, let's apply this formalism to what we want. So n equal to one super conform field theory on S three times S one. So the super algebra is S U two comma. Oh, sorry, it should be algebra. Algebra. The super algebra is S U two comma two slash one, which is the same algebra as S O four comma two slash one. And you see that this is the ADS5 super algebra or CFT4 super algebra, and that has uh, an SU2 times SU2. Okay, so J and J tilde, and there's a time, um, there's a uh, energy or, or time direction, that's that quantum number, and then there's a, sorry, that's, that, that's there, and then there is a U1R quantum number. Okay, that's that. Uh, so these are the same charges that we saw yesterday, and then there are supercharges. Uh, of the type Q and Q tilde. So they're left moving and right moving under this SU2 times SU2 tilde. So these are two one, these are one two. You can, this is completely standard. Pick up a book and look at the super algebra. We just want one complex supercharge. We'll pick one of them, okay, Q tilde minus, uh, which has the following uh, anti commutator Q. So I'll call that Q. Q, Q dagger is a combination of these bosonic charges, E, R, and uh, J tilde. All right. Uh, and now, if you want to write the index, if you want to calculate an index, so what, what we want to do is to write down an index, which is the most one general one possible allowed by the algebra. So you ask for all the operators which commute with the supersymmetry okay, in the algebra. So you ask, what is the commutant of Q? And uh, the answer is that it's this SU2, one inside SU2, one that has rank two, okay, and this generated by j1 plus half r and j2 plus half r. Okay, you can also kind of see it from here. J, j tilde naught is j1 plus j2. Okay, there's equal, there's j1 comma q is the same thing and j2 comma q, q is the same. All right, so the most general index is like this. You have two chemical, so there are only two things you can put. So it's minus trace minus under the f, e to the minus beta q q bar times plus sigma coupling to j1 plus half r and tau coupling to j2 plus half r. Okay. And in addition, of course, you can put flavors. Flavors means it commutes with the full super algebra. So here you can also put mu. I will not in this um, some mu i f i if you want. Okay, these are flavors. Um, except that it's if you want to look at the n equal to four super angles problem, that has an issue for R symmetry. So you write that in n equal to one language, you'll have U1 times flavors, so that you can call some combination of this is R that we have, and then there's F1 and F2. Okay. So I won't do that today. All right. So that was a brief review. Any questions from students? So, yes. Statistics means like the boson fermion. Yeah, I mean, for, for n equal to four super angles, it's an R symmetry. So, so you can absorb everything in one, but then you have to, yeah. So if it's an R symmetry, it can always, you have to be careful about it. Okay, now how to calculate the super conformal index? Again, a small review. Yes, yes, so yeah, most of the subtleties are, yeah, I mean, you can write n equal to four and you can just write the minimal n equal to one index and it's completely captured. Uh, so, in a conformal field theory, there's a state operator correspondence, and you use that. So, instead of counting states, you can enumerate local BPS operators. That's many times easier to do, uh, especially when you have a Lagrangian description of the CFT, like n equal to four superangles. You just write down the fields and you just ask what are the operators which are BPS. Okay, so other types of supersymmetric non superconformal indices are harder. Many times because you can have non-local operators, you can have monopoles. Okay, this one is, is easy. Uh, 
And I won't do that. So another, you can either do that. You can do this by a counting problem uh, as a counting problem, or by the Lagrangian description using localization. Okay. So you calculate at some free point, and then you argue that the the cup it's independent of coupling. Okay. So in that case, you just have to do it multiplied by multiplied. Okay. So both of these things have been done in the literature. There are. Uh, I won't do it. You can see the the reviews if you want. Um, and I'll just tell you what the answer is. Okay. Um, so let's now take U n super Engels theory, uh, and what we want to calculate is this: trace minus one to the f p to the j one plus r by two q to the j two plus r by two. So p and q are the exponentials of sigma and tau, and you want to put this on s three times s one. And the answer is as follows: the answer is an integral over the space of U n matrices, unitary matrices, n by n matrices, of an exponential. Of an infinite sum, which is all completely governed by one function called the single letter index. The single letter index is the same trace that you want to compute. Sorry, is the same trace that you want to compute over a different Hilbert space. It's the same trace over the over a much smaller Hilbert space, which is the so-called space of letters, which is that. You write down the fields, the elementary fields of the theory and the derivatives. These are all the letters, and write them at one point in 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 this. Okay, this is some quantum mechanical subspace, so it's much easier. And you calculate the same f. You get a function, and the answer to this um, superconform index is that you take that function and you write this infinite sum. It's called a pleistic exponential. Um, I mean, exponentiate it like so. And here you have some un. This is the un adjoint character. So here I'm, I'm treating a theory which is un super Engels theory where everybody is in the adjoint representation. Oh, thank you so much. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and then the the sort of rationale for the I mean one way of understanding this in the counting problem is this is the BPS letters, this sum and exponential basically puts together the letters and symmetrizes it appropriately, like according to bosons and fermions. Um, and then each sort of word, so those are words, and each word will also have some gauge indices because of because it's a gauge theory. So you have to integrate over the you have to average over the gauge group to project onto the gauge invariants. Okay, so that's that's one way to understand this, or you can calculate this by localization. As I said, that if you, if anyone wants to discuss this after the talk, I'm happy to explain this. But it's, it's fairly standard stuff. Look at these reviews. All right. So I'll take that as as a given formula, and also that for n equal to one super multiplets, these are the answers. So as I said, you only have to do it multiplet by multiplet, uh, and the answer is some simple rational function of p and q. Okay. And so for n equal to four super animals, uh, you just add. One vector and three chirals in the n equal to one language. Hmm. Roughly speaking, these are there's an s three times s one, so there's four derivatives, and two of those directional derivatives are actually supersymmetric. So you get an infinite series, and these are some fields which are supersymmetric. So p is. Yeah, here, here. Please, that's my standard notation. Okay, I like to think of these as functions of sigma and tau rather than functions of p and q, for reasons I'll tell you later. <laughs> All right, but so that's my standard. Uh, p and q are are always. Okay. Um, and then finally, so everything here is is I told you what this is. This is. And then the last part is the measure. The measure is the invariant measure, the Haar measure. So if you diagonalize the unitary matrix, so these are some eigenvalues. I'm going to call these small u's the eigenphases or eigenangles. And there are n of them for a un theory, and for S u n there's one constraint. And the measure is the usual invariant measure. So it's a flat measure on on these n variables. There's some vial symmetry factor, and there's some random one determinant over here. Okay. If you have not seen it, please don't 
expect to understand it in one minute. I'm happy to explain this later, but uh, I believe many of you already know this. Okay. All right. So using that, you can write that matrix integral as an as an n-dimensional integral. Okay. Du here, whenever I put an underline, means it's an n-dimensional integral. Each of these goes between zero and one. Okay. Let's go over a circle. Okay. So can I just ask again? Maybe you want to do it later, but let me ask anyway. That ultimately. Uh, this i n of sigma tau yeah. right, would be compared with is the area of our core yeah. written in terms of chemical potential. Exactly. It, it, they agree. Exactly. That, that's exactly what, sorry, so maybe I was, if you're asking this question, it was, it means I was not clear. Uh, that's what I tried to say here that the goal is uh, is this. I want to analyze the superconformal index. And there will be a saddle point of the superconformal index such that it gives you the free energy of the black hole, yeah. which I already showed yesterday is it's a Lejeune transform of, of of the area. Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, saying that you will compare the dn one and two or directly IC. I'll do both. Okay. And both will agree. Yes, I mean of and course. For both the Lejeune transform is the uh, right answer. No, no. Here I don't even. I'll just. This is numerically. I'm going to show you. Okay. Fine. Yeah. But you could do legendary transform. Yeah, and the, so yeah, so you can do this numerically, this numerically, in a, and check. You can do this analytically, this analytically, and check. Mm -hmm. And then you know that this and this are Lagrangian transforms, and you know that this and this are Lagrangian transforms. So this everything fits. Yeah, I mean we know that they are Laplace transform. So to show that they are legendary transform, you have to. Yeah, there's some saddle point approximation, which yeah. is the next part. Exactly. Okay. So then I'm just wondering that why, I mean, why did people think that they are the transform? I'll, I'll explain that. Yeah. That I'll explain. So, but sorry, why did people think that, uh, uh, that it doesn't contain? It doesn't match, yeah. Because earlier I thought the uh, understanding of the five counting gives much less than what the. Yeah, price. that's incorrect. That's incorrect. After that, uh, people tried to explain the lack of agreement in various ways, like there's a fermion zero mode and this, that, but no such fermion zero was, mode was ever found. And this is one reason I started with the gravitational ensemble, gravitational discussion. That I wanted to make it clear that the black hole entropy is genuinely an extremization problem as usual. Of so it's a Gibbons Hawking extremization problem with the right regulator, and therefore it can be embedded into ADS CFT and it must work. So I, I wanted to make sure there's no gap in that argument. Yes, yeah, yeah. but I'm yeah. saying we calculated both sides and found disagreement. I found. Well, calculated something so that that's exactly what. So yeah, maybe I can answer that since we were the ones to make this error. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, of course we we computed the thing at n equal to infinity, which matched, and then uh, you know we we tried to do something at finite n, and we found we didn't have a have a phase transition, and maybe that 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 was not correct. But I thought the uh, expectation was roughly that you know in the elliptic genus it's very special because the elliptic genus is roughly the partition function of one side apart from a trace of minus one to the f on the other side. But in other dimensions, you know, at least we thought that, you know, uh, it, a trace of minus one to the F might just see large cancellations. Yeah. So it wasn't clear that it had to match. Uh, okay. So, so that's exactly what's not true. So what is, what is yeah. true is that if you, yeah. It was not clear that it had to match, but we actually found that it didn't match, I thought, right? Uh, I, I think that the, the, uh, the saddle point analysis, we didn't do correctly as Samir will tell us the finite N thing, but uh, at, at N equal to infinity, we found it did match. Uh, yeah. But we probably didn't extract the co the coefficient at finite n correctly. Is if I think uh, is what Samir is going to tell us. Is that right? Yeah. So that's what I'll explain. And also, n equal to infinity. There is a comment to be made that this uh, this is this will be the subject of my third lecture. That n equal to infinity limit is very subtle. So if you if you fix charges and take n equal to infinity, then you don't expect to see the black hole. These are operators which are very very small. You don't form a black hole. Even in the gravity, you just get gravitons. That matches, and, and Suvrat and friends had found that. Well, the n equal to infinity limit, what you need to do is you're tracking states or operators which run with n square. That's not so easy to do, and, and that's also what I'll discuss. Okay. Uh, so this is the answer. This is the explicit integral. Um, it's an n dimensional integral. And the coefficient, so this is some Pokhammer symbol, and here you have some functions, special functions called elliptic gamma functions, defined as some infinite product. Okay, so that's, that was supposed to be the review. I guess one hour.
and now I want to, yeah. No, no, no. Gravity is difficult to do finite. I mean, yesterday was brief discussion. You can do one over n corrections, but I won't discuss that here. So, okay. So, so I'll ex I'll explain all of this in the in, in this half part of the lecture. All these questions that you've been asking, I, I will try to explain. If it's still not clear, then please. Yeah. 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 I'll ask. Yeah. Okay. All of these questions are really about what is the limit you have to take. And it's a, these are excellent questions. Okay, different so avatars of the same question. This is, and this was why there was some confusion in the field a little bit. That's why I want to do it very slowly. Generalized entropy means? No, no, no. Gravity, we just do good old fashioned Gibbons Hawking with this regulator, like what we did yesterday. That's it. Now I want to show from field theory that. <clears throat> uh, you indeed recover what 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 you're supposed to recover okay, in the correct limit. All right. Uh, yeah. uh, but just to clarify, yeah. the last uh, the expression you showed on the last slide that was known from this was known for the, yeah 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 this is all a review so this was all a review uh, and uh, so it's true for any n and uh, absolutely it's only a question of extracting the information exactly. from this uh, precisely. Okay, so this all of this was known. Yeah, in fact, this form it should so there's this you know the paper of Suvrat and friends, and maybe I showed you yesterday this this if you want to look at this particular form, uh, I don't know who did I, well, there's certainly one place where you can look it up. I'm not sure it's the first one, but there's a nice paper by Spiridonov and and Vartanov, there's a review. I don't remember the uh, the the year, but please ask me later if you want. Or look at my papers where I have references. All right. Question. Yeah. So uh, this uh, this Witten index is independent of beta because it's topological, right? Well, it's independent of beta for the reason. Maybe that's true. It's for me. It's independent of beta for the reason I. I showed, I proved there's a, all, all E is the eigenvalue of H, St states come in representation, which are either, when H is greater than zero, they always come in paired representations, right. there's right. a minus one to the F and there's a cancellation. Yeah, and so, uh, so in your case also, is, is some, is, uh, is a similar mechanism operational, uh, the, that's the reason it's independent of beta. Precisely. So that's exactly what I showed here that this is the most general index. This is of the sort that we just explained. Okay, the super conformal index is, is a generalized written index. That's exactly what I was trying to explain here. No, you have this extra term. So I'm not sure. These? Uh, well, yeah, those, but if you go down a bit, uh, the later expression. Uh, yeah, this expression. These operators, so I tried to explain this. The Here I can put any operator that commutes with the supercharge. And then I ask, what are all the operators that commutes with this supercharge? And that's called the commutant. And the it's a two-dimensional space generated by these two charges, these two combinations of charges. And so you put these two combinations of charges. That's the best thing you can do. Or you can put flavors, which by definition commute with the whole super algebra. So that's the most general index. Okay, so now um, here we are. Rajesh wants to say uh, So that's the index. As uh, so, I'm going to fix n, and now I'll start. Now I'll really start answering these questions. Okay, all, all of you. So, um, so here. So the question is, what is the meaning of the growth of states? Okay. So first, remember that um, in gravity. The, the gravitational charges are, are defined with a G Newton in it. So there's a one over N square of the scale out. So these are the integer charges in field theory and the, gravi the charges that enter the gravitational calculations are those divided by N square. So these I'll call J, I, and Q. Okay. So if you want these to be finite, the gravitational charges, you want the field theory charges to be N square times some 
small number. Okay. Now you can do two things. You can either say, sorry, here of course I didn't mean N1, N2, I meant Ji, Q. Okay. You can either, sorry. After G Thank you. Okay. You can either fix the gravitational charges and scale n to infinity. That's the correct thing to do in gravity. Because that's the weakly coupled gravity. You want small gn, you want fixed gravitational charges. That's the regime in which the black hole solution is originally written. Okay. That's what should be called the large n limit. Okay. Um, but you could do another thing. You can fix n and just scale the charges to infinity. So that means it's like you fix a theory, fix a theory, and then you look at very high energy or high charge states. And for that reason, it's called the Cardi light limit. Okay. Now, the, what does the Cardi? So I'll come back to the large limit. The Cardi light limit. What does it do? It captures these large charge states, and in this limit. So I should say one more thing. That these two are completely different limits. There's a priori, they're, they're completely different limits. There's one regime of overlap where you take, take let's say, uh, this, uh, how do I say, it? maybe this, this fixed, this to infinity, and then scale this to infinity. Okay. Or you could do it from this way and you'll reach the same. So that's, that's a regime where the black hole solution is correct, but that black hole is infinitely large. Okay. It's, it's, it fills up ADS. That's another way to say it pictorially. That's the kind of regime that Strominger and Wapfa and Sen had originally done the black holes in flat space. They're just infinitely large black holes. There's no other scale in, in flat space. Okay. So you start there and you start to uh, go in. Now, one technical point is that because you have two charges, sorry, I call them N1 and N2 somewhere, um, you need to say how exactly they scale. Okay, again, put it, if you want to put it in a computer, you have to say which direction am I going? Okay, and therefore the ratio has to be one way to do it is to fix the ratio. You say that n1 equals n2. Okay, in the canonical ensemble, you say we have to do a similar thing, can sigma equal to tau. Okay. You can generalize this to sigma over tau fixed. Okay, so that's the Cardi limit. Uh, the large n limit, so the Cardi limit is something you can study on a computer, and then you can take n to infinity. Okay, you can study it for SU2, SU3, or U2, U3, U4, and then take N to infinity. Okay, that's a perfectly well defined problem. Large limit is more subtle, uh, and I'll tell you why it's more subtle. Um, maybe only in the third lecture, but these, just to, I wanted to give you these, these two things. So I want to sort of put a big question mark here. Um, okay, how to do this is not extremely clear, but certainly we can work in a regime where um, you fix N, study either the microcanonical or the canonical. And then, uh, then take large. Okay. Uh, any questions about this? Maybe you want to re-ask the questions, and I'll show you the answers. Is something something not clear here? Maybe I'll go to the to the answers. And okay. So first, let me show you the microcanonical ensemble. Okay. So let's do it here. So, so this is from uh, I took it from a talk. So there's a bit of repeat. So the, this is the general. Set up. Now I'm going to put, uh, so here are the three charges, J1, J2, and uh, instead of R, I call it Q. Sorry about that. Um, and then this is the trace. It's trace minus one to the F, and I put sigma equals tau. Okay, so there's one combination, 2J plus Q, to which this couples, and that I'll call I N of tau. Okay, and here is the Fourier expansion. Uh, this 2J plus Q, I'll call N by 3. And, and this normalization is chosen from N equal to 4 super M mills. Uh, remember, J is always half integer, but Q, the R charge, depends on the theory. So, n equal to four super angles, this comes in units of a third. Okay, that's why I've chosen this to be an integer. Uh, here, a three, so that n is an integer. Okay. On the gravitational side, uh, there was a black hole with these three charges, J1, J2, Q. And the simplest situation, which is the analog of, of tau equal to sigma, in, is that J1 equals J2. I'll call it J. And, I mean... The, the correct thing to do is, of course, the chemical potentials omega 1 equals omega 2, but on the gravitational solutions, these two are the same. All right. And here's this QJ relation that we saw yesterday. Okay. So, therefore, the entropy 
which had a form like this. There's a one over G Newton, which is N square times some function of the charges. You can write in terms of one charge because these two are constrained and you can choose that charge to be this N. Okay, I'll, I'll call this function small s, the entropy density, small s as a function of N over N square. Okay, so in gravity, I want this N to run N square times some number nu, which you can effectively take to be continuous. Okay, is this clear? All right, so now I want to compare these two things, dn and this entropy. Okay, so what's the meaning? So I'm going to repeat what I said there, but now for one variable, um, that when I say that these two should be equal, I can either, sorry, first I'll show you what the entropy looks like. So this is the black hole entropy, which I didn't show a plot yesterday. I showed how to derive it. Um, this is the entropy versus N. This is the bare charge, the integer charge. And you see the growth with respect to N in terms of nu, the N over N square, it looks like nu to the two thirds. Okay, you see, see that? Exactly, yeah. So this is a black, sorry, black hole entropy formula. <laughs> I just put the formula. Okay, so, so sorry, in fact, many people have said this, I keep forgetting to, I mean the formula, okay? And now you have this, and uh, you see the growth with respect to N as well, the rank as well. Okay, so as correctly said, this should only be trusted, this formula should only be trusted when N is very large. Well, n is infinite. It could be. So, yeah. So, so the question is, how small can it be? And there's a nice surprise here. So that's uh, that's exactly the point. So it should be infinite, but in fact, it's okay. So what are the limits? The limits are, firstly, this is the gravitational. So large n limit. You fix the gravitational charge and scale both to infinity, or you do the Cardi likely. Okay, so this is the one you can put on a computer and then study n. Okay, so here are the plots. Again, the they're very different, completely different. Except there's one regime of overlap where you can take this and then take n to infinity, or you take this and then take nu to infinity. Okay, a priori this different. So here are the plots. Sorry, just yeah. one minute. Uh, so this plot. It's a bit confusing. So, if you just plot the small s function mm -hmm. as a function of n over n square, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. call it new? s of nu as a function of nu, uh, the statement is that you will get a single curve. Yeah, that's this this curve. Uh, statement is that you get all these curves to collapse to a single curve. Or I'm trying to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this this is this is the curve. Yeah, there's just one over g newton outside. No? So, if you scale that out, you just get this curve. Okay. Right. There may be a better, that might be better that you just plot one curve, which is the black hole entropy formula. The reason I put this is because I'm going to use this in the, yeah. So may, thank you for the clarification. So, so instead of saying that, that I could have said that, you know, that the curve, th this is the same curve for different values of N. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so maybe uh, let me just understand. So you're taking this S of new, which is. Yeah. But, but remember, remember that it's the same curve, but new is also a function of N square. So. You have to sort of scale it that way and shrink it at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so the statement is that this S of nu is something that you get from the graph. Exactly. Exactly. And then you're just plotting for this, like, substituting for nu n over n square. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Because I want to. That's the thing I can reproduce from field theory. So, so this is to prepare for, for the field theory. Exactly. That's exactly why I'm I'm doing it the wrong way. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so that's here are the plots. So this is u2, u3, and so on. I could go up to u10. Um, so what are these numbers? So this is a function of log of d of n as a function of the rank, okay, uh, in absolute value as a function of n. Okay, and I'm plotting the, the solid curve is this black hole entropy form. All right. Um, and these numbers here, yeah. so all I do is I take that formula that I showed you, I write it as a Fourier expansion, and just calculate it. It's not completely trivial, this, this took some work, um, that's in this paper. So this slows down on the computer quite fast, but you can, you can maybe on Friday I'll show how, how to generate these plots, okay? Um, but, you know, one over n squared is already one over 100, so it's, as, as you were saying, it's, but notice even for small n, this, there's a very good agreement. Okay, so that's the first thing to notice. There's an extremely good agreement. What 
you know, if, if you might have first, yeah, so basically these, let's look here, for instance, so these, these things essentially live on this curve, okay? Yeah. Why is the cell Okay, good, good. So I want all questions of this. Let me collect these questions. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. So the, there are many things going on here. So firstly, there's a scale here, which is n square. So this sort of this oscillation is, is, is there everywhere. You can see it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's the rescale version of that. So if you this, so okay, so let me make comments and then let, if I still don't cover everything, I'll tell you. Firstly, roughly speaking, it goes this way. Then there are even the kind of average value of this disagrees from from this curve at n equal to two. Okay. That becomes better and better at larger. Here, somehow it's oscillating around this curve more and more. And it's just eyeballing these things. But there's an oscillation. The oscillation is of, it scales with n. Okay. And it's fairly regular. It's, it's almost regular is the correct answer. And that breaks down at very small values of n. So there's one, some very funny thing going on, and then there's some regular oscillation. Same thing, very funny thing, regular oscillation. Okay, these are the comments. Is there, did I cover the? Yeah. Precisely. So, so now let me go through all of, yeah, precisely. Let me go through. So this, the fact that this average value itself differs, gets better, is a one over n correction. Because the black hole entropy formula should not be valid for for, for n equal to two, okay? That's the one over. So already there's some log correction it makes it slightly better and stuff like that. Then the oscillations is what I'm going to explain next. And this, the very low energy states is exactly what Ashok said. And it, this relates to what Subrat was mentioning earlier. These here are actually multi-gravitons. They're not black holes. And on Friday, I'll show you explicitly that if you, so I'll sort of super, try to superimpose gravitons and black holes. This follows the, the multi-gravitons very well. And then something happens, and then you go back to black holes. Okay, this is that more or less. Uh, just a second. Uh, I just want to check that. Does yeah. <laughs> so that, uh, they, they didn't do it this way. I, I can tell you what they. But I can't translate because they did not do it. So I can tell you what they do. I mean, Subra, please correct me if I'm wrong. What they did was so I, I, yeah. I mean, I didn't quite want to do this, but. What they did was they, they tried to solve the matrix model at large n, right? So it's not this kind of an analysis. Here I'm trying to do some Cardi limit. They tried to do the larger limit. And in the larger limit, um, you try to find saddle points a la, you know, matrix models like, uh, like the BIPZ, Brazilian Six and Paris is a type of analysis. Now that analysis, as I'll show you on, on Friday, doesn't go through. There's an issue here because in terms of the eigenvalue, there's no single particle potential where the eigenvalues can condense. There's only two particle repulsions. It's a very funny matrix model. It's because of the adjoint. There's only adjoint. Yeah. And therefore that analysis has to be sort of done more carefully. There's one saddle point of that larger matrix model, which is a correct saddle point, which gives the entropy of the gas of gravitons, that one. Yeah. And what I'll show you on Friday is that there are other large and saddle points, but as I said, it's slightly less rigorous than what I'll show you today, which reproduces the black hole entropy. Okay. What I'm going to do today is completely rigorous. That's why I wanted to do this. Like I'll be only, do, yeah. Yeah, in the large end limit, roughly, roughly that's what I mean. So large end limit is still under construction, but I think we understand more or less how to do it. Okay. Yeah, just to say, I mean, what, what I find really remarkable about this whole thing is, in principle, the answer was there, even at finite end. Yeah. So if someone had only thought, if I mean, if he had only thought that, you know, one just numerically evaluates it for n equal to 10, which in principle could have been done. Exactly, uh, or, or n equal to 2. 
yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was it was really the yeah it was some mental block I think the fact that we thought that you know it it uh, it it wasn't going to match because it matched with the gravitons. I mean, in principle, this could have been done. We just had to expand that answer numerically, which which we didn't do. Okay, so that's that. Um, so, Another question. Yeah. Maybe I, uh, yeah, Logan. Huh? Is there a is there a statement that uh, the things the exact answers yeah. are always you know like uh, are below most of the time or are below what in the sense that black hole formula the, the, it's sort of well that's, that's not true no here you can see it's 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 more yeah on the average, on the average you said average. the average is moving up towards ah, you mean this one over n correction yeah so i haven't analyzed this i i think that's true but this requires some serious numerical analysis which i haven't done yet yeah i'm, I'm asking there is a deckelstein hawking formula yeah does it overestimate the exact yeah so value? so yeah uh, yeah so i think you're right. so uh, another way to say it is in this example say what's the sign of the one, first one over n correction so there's a particular sign eh? and i think that's correct there is a negative sign okay but speak up please ah, okay good so um, so I have a question. Uh, so so one second, let, let me yeah. just answer Justin's question. So, in fact, all mathematicians to whom I've shown this, they complain this is the wrong thing to do. You shouldn't plot absolute values. Um, you should because d is some. So why did I put a absolute value? That's exactly what I'll show next. Because these d's are actually not integers; they are integers times some phases, and that's related to this oscillation. Okay. And in fact, it's nicer to cleaner to write that whole d. So you get some absolute value. And you get a phase, and that's where I'm headed. And you can see here, if just by looking at these plots, you can try to guess what's going on. So there are oscillations. So that means that there's some e to the s black hole plus e to the i times something, or actually cosine something, right? And another, you can see that here. So somehow this it goes off to zero. Okay. That's very funny, but it's not funny because I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm plotting a log. Log of zero is minus infinity. That's what is going on. That's a, so what is going on is really this e to the s black hole times cosine of something, and these are the zeros of the of the cosine function. Okay, so sorry, there was a question. Well, I change. Yeah. So the question is, uh, how is this s black hole computed? Because if you if you say that it was it is it's the same as a supergravity calculation. Is yes. that what you're saying? First of all, then yes. that, that corresponds to n equals infinity, right? That kind yes. of corresponds to n equals infinity. Whereas here you have finite. N. Yes. So, uh, uh, so how 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 are you like comparing the two? I mean, for, that that's the first question. And the second question is in that case, in that computation, you had a certain formula uh, in terms of the area which was related to the various parameters of the black hole. How are those parameters related to the n here? Because here you have SBH times two times uh, SBH as a function of two and n. Or so the answer is as follows: n is one over g newton. That's how it's related. That was what I discussed yesterday. G newton is one over n square. Sorry, not n. Yeah. And the first, the answer to the first question is what we were just discussing. So the other people also ask the same question. So the answer is what I plot is not is the is the entropy formula, and miraculously it agrees very well even for small n. So that's your comment, and so it's a good comment. Okay. So now uh, I want to explain this from the canonical ensemble, but I'm also aware of time, so please tell me. I was supposed to. Yeah, I have like. It's not a five-minute job now. Now it's like I was, I was, I have like twenty minutes or something, so I can. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's all, yeah, exactly. Sometimes, yeah, exactly. If n equal to eight it doesn't because there's a large log correction. So it, it depends on the details of what's going on in the corrections. Organizer. <laughs> okay, so stop me whenever you want to stop me and give me a five-minute warning. <laughs> stop. All right, but okay. Since there were many questions, I'm, I excuse myself. Um, good. So now I want to derive this from the. Sorry, did I leave anything hanging? Or it's okay so far? Yeah. So canonical on some. Okay. So now I want to analyze this and ask how do I get the free energy? Okay. So now I put tau equal to sigma, 
So now the free energy is pi i over 27 times n square times this cubic divided by quadratic. Okay, 2 tau plus 1 cube divided by tau square. For those of you who are interested in modular forms, notice that this, so you want i, the index is equal to the exponential of this. Okay, notice that such a behavior can never appear from a modular form, from a holomorphic modular form, which only has 1 over tau ever. Okay. Now, again, so now in the um, canonical ensemble, you can have two limits. The large n limit is tau fixed and n goes to infinity. And I emphasize that this has not been really solved, although there are very good ideas and methods, uh, but not satisfactory for, for instance, for mathematicians. Um, and here, uh, this is n fixed and uh, naively tau goes to zero because as n goes to infinity, naively tau goes to zero. So let's, before that, I just want to show the details of the saddle point calculation. So you take this free energy and you want to extremize it in tau uh, with some um, charge n. Okay, uh, this is field theoretic charge n. You write the saddle point equation. You get some equation like that. This is n over n square, which is mu. And now notice that as mu goes to infinity, uh, you see that the essentially tau goes to zero. You can, if tau goes to zero, it's self-consistent. You can ignore this, you can ignore this, and it's one over tau cube. Okay, and in that limit, you just have the tau, tau cube is new, is one over new. Okay, except that tau cube because new means that there are three solutions for that. Okay. One of them is, is in the lower half plane, which we don't want. Tau is, is in the upper half plane for convergence. One of them is on the real axis, and the correct tau is actually somewhere over there. All right. It's just a small observation, which will come back. No, here I'm just sort of giving you, I'm just saying that tau is not supposed to be in the lower half plane. Okay. It's a bit... Maybe it could be here, but tau is also not supposed to be on the real axis. It's really supposed to be on the. Okay. So, of course, tau is very small. So, I'm saying that small, usually we expect the saddle point to lie very close to the real axis, but above. All right. Now, uh, there's a subtlety, which is so recall that, um, that in comparing the gravity and the field theory, there was a shift of one, which I call n0 that the gravitational sigma and tau were related to the field theory sigma tau by sigma plus one comma tau. Okay, in the beginning of the lecture today, we saw this. Uh, where was it? Here. Okay, so this was, so I showed you that this is the super conformal index, but with a shift of one. Okay. Now, if you repeat that analysis for sigma equal to tau, Essentially, you'll find for n equal to four super angles, you'll find that the two tau in the super conformal field theory in gravity are related also by shift of one. Okay, that um, is a small exercise. And so, in the this is the gravitational tau, the field theory tau is one plus that object. Okay, and this is what I call a complex saddle in a sense that I'll explain. Okay, so this object lives on the upper half plane, and this is really on the real axis. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by complex cell question. So, I mean, everything depends on e to the power of some 2 pi i tau. Uh, mm. so, thanks. So, this is a normalization. Thank you very much. That I have e to the 2 pi i tau n by 3, where n is an integer. So, it's not quite That's periodic. Yeah. So, for the statement is that tau and tau plus 1 are actually different. Let, let's say, should I think of that as you're computing the Free super conformal index for the CFT with a different theta. Is that with a different? With, by turning on from theta, uh, theta QCD theta. Sorry, theta is what? Uh, the QCD theta, theta angle theta. Oh, no, no, this tau is not the coupling constant of Jang Mills. It's not. Oh, okay, yeah. So this is like some chemical. Potential. It's some background. Uh, it's the twist of the of the sphere over the the circle. Right. Okay. So you're saying you you turn on some twist. So this is some twisted partition. Function. Uh, yeah, so see what is going on. Yeah, exactly. So let's see what is the meaning of this complex shadow. So let's do an example. So suppose you have a function like this. F of Q is some Fourier series of this, uh, Laurent uh, power series of this type. Df times Q to the n. And Q is equal to 2 pi tau. So if you want to invert this, you'll do some contour integral 
over the origin take some contour which which um, surrounds the origin and now typically these functions that we have uh, have a sort of region of definition which is the unit disk in q which is the upper half plane in tau okay and typically what happens is inside this unit disk these functions are holomorphic okay, completely holomorphic and that's why this contour can be deformed anywhere you want near the edges of the the boundary of the unit circle is where these functions become singular and those are the ones which contribute to the growth of of d okay let's do an example so take f to be 1 over eta so there's just a free boson partition function so you ask where does this function become singular inside when q is smaller than 1 it's it's not singular but when tau goes to 0 which is q goes to 1 that's here this function behaves in a singular manner and using the modular behavior you can see that it goes as exponential of 1 over tau okay times pi i over 12 okay now that singularity is precisely what gives you the growth of states of this free boson right so if you now write this as an integral in tau you get uh, you can estimate the function by this this divergent part and then you have this minus n tau and in the saddle point now you do a saddle point approximation as n goes to infinity and you see the tau the saddle point value is square root of n okay 1 over square root of n okay so it's something very very close to that so tau equals i over square root of n means q is just very close to this okay because q is e to the 2 pi i tau and that's exactly what gives you this growth of states of the microcanonical so the growth of states of the microcanonical index as for large charges maps to a growth of the function itself near the edge of the unit disk okay very good now let's do another example which is g which is f of it the same f except the tau is shifted by a half okay now you see we call that dg this picture is all these things are exactly the same except that because tau goes to tau plus half to take this picture and then i have to sort of rotate that picture by 180 degrees okay so now the dominant maybe i can show you both at the same time like that all right so the dominant singularity now is here because it's the same function okay so it's the tau uh, saddle point is half plus uh, the same the same saddle point and now let's compare the two functions what is happening the because the only difference is 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 this shift of half is a minus 1 to the f in the fourier series so the fourier coefficients are related by sign by minus 1 to the n each of dg of n is minus 1 to the n df of n the saddle point the imaginary part of the saddle point is the same and the real part of the saddle point shifts by half that shift is the one that absorbs this phase okay now for g suppose you are only given g okay the dominant growth is not here where you would usually look oops sorry now i ah yes yes So say say again. Has where 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 here? Yeah, here you mean. So just ignore this for here you mean. Just keep that aside for a moment. That was also asked here. The normalization is slightly different. Here the normalization. Sorry about that. Is is this? It's it's n over three. Right. So really, this one should be one third. okay so but let, let's just go back to so eta function where it's periodic with one so the periodicity in this yeah my mathematician friends will kill me but the periodicity here is tau goes to tau plus 3 okay so let's go back to the standard thing tau goes to tau plus 1 so it's half uh so g has dominant growth at the new saddle and we can ask what happens at the old saddle oh that's all you are asking sorry it's just half. thank you <laughs> thanks okay so uh anyway but that was also a good point um so the now you can ask what happens to g so here is the dominant growth you can say what happens here there's some sub dominant growth if at all or maybe no growth okay so here's an example it's an exercise take f equals 1 over theta 4 the jacobi theta functions okay then if you if you do the shift Tau goes to tau plus half, right? Uh, you get g equals one over theta three. 
Okay. And you can check that as tau goes to zero, f has the behavior as if it's a theta function. If you if you remember the interpretation, you'll see that that's essentially some fermion in the right sector, so that it's like a boson. But in fact, you'll see that log g does not have any growth here. G does not have any growth here. So it's a very stark example to, to, to show such things can happen. Okay. All right. Now, hmm? question? No. Okay. So now let's get back to the super conformal index. Yeah, is that is this point clear? This toy example? Yeah. So back to the super conformal index. Um, so remember, so today we'll discuss it like this, like this n-dimensional integral, and the Friday we'll look at the matrix version of this. Sorry, Please. just one. So you have you have two functions, yeah. and then uh, you're saying the coefficients yeah. are just differ by some things. But yes, exactly. Okay, but but we have a function, that, but but from the function you are trying to estimate its asymptotic growth. Yes, yes. Uh, but they are very different. Uh, at the same point, they're very different because what is the asymptotic growth? It's sum of these coefficients times q to the n. Now, if all let's imagine all the of one of them is positive, which is true for one over eta. For g for for this for g, you will have opposite signs. So when you add up the series, they'll actually all cancel, and there's no growth. That's roughly what's going on. The saddle point has changed here. I showed you explicitly. This is the new saddle point where imaginary part is the same. And the real part shift by half. It's the same function. So the whatever was here went here. Okay. Yeah. And if you do the saddle point analysis, if you first do the saddle point approximation, you're infinitely far from any other saddle points. So you know you don't see the whole function. So in gravity, that's what is happening. If you choose the wrong saddle point, you'll just get a very wrong answer. So so if you substitute tau equals let's say zero or half plus epsilon and substitute that into the function, you don't get a periodic function. It's, it's only the full non-perturbative thing that's periodic. So, so the statement is that if I have a, a series, uh, just, just to understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. which has like, let's say a lot of, some, some integers, right. some, some uh, integers, exactly. but, but positive, negative, positive. Right. Good. And if I have some, let's say some integral representation of yeah, yeah. the function, yeah. if I try to kind of estimate what the structures are, yeah. uh, how, how they grow by certain point, I can get it very well. You can, so all I'm saying is that in order to estimate it, you, you, you have to do it slightly more carefully. So what is not quite right is, uh, is this, that you, how do we do it? We say, we look at the, here, Fourier series, maybe I'll just write it, it's easier. Right, it's this part that is not quite right. This part. Sorry, it's bad color. Okay, so you can see that if d of n, d n of n, is let's let me forget the n. All I'm saying is this: it's d tau i n of tau. Let's say there's no n. e to the minus two pi i n tau. Okay, this is going from zero to n. I'm just saying that usually we'd say if tau is real and there's no i there, suppose this is e to the minus n t, the t is real. Then it's clear that as n goes to infinity, t has to go to zero. Here, it's not so clear because tau has a real and imaginary part. The correct statement is not tau goes to zero, but it's imaginary tau goes to zero. So if you want to do subtle points, better check not just tau goes to zero, but Imaginary tau goes to zero and, and scan the whole real axis, at least between zero and one. Okay. Still controlled by a saddle point, you have to find the right saddle. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I'm just saying that the saddle is need not be a tau equal to zero. Yeah. It can be that. Okay. So you'll have to scan zero to one. But since you asked, it's a very nice thing. Now we look at this dn q to the n. Okay. Now imagine there are signs, just only signs, plus or minus. Okay. Then write this as d1 of n q to the n minus d2 of n q to the n, where both d1 and d2 are positive. Okay, you can always do that. Then you see that the, the growth, imagine these things grow. So the, the original growth can either be at zero or at, at half, because these two series will both grow and they'll either add or they'll subtract. Okay. Now, suppose the phases are not just minus one, but some 
eat some seventh root of unity. Then you'll have seven such series. And then the things you have to check for leading growth are the seven roots of unity. You don't have to check all the infinite number of real zero to one. Okay. Yeah. But, but either way, this integral, if I do it carefully yeah. and look at all the saddle points yeah. and, and do the standard thing where I, I look at what would be the dominant saddle. Yes, exactly. That would give me... Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah it's just perfectly, it's, it's just nothing, you know, that's, that's how it should be and that's how it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, yeah. Many times you don't have, in this case you do. In gravity, you don't, that's the issue. So that's exactly the point, right? But from field theory, the, you usually have, uh, you know, many times you have, or at least sometimes, yeah. Okay. Uh, and now what is happening is uh, here in the super conformal index, the, again, now I've, I've done sigma equals tau. So that's the function. This is like, it's called the, it's the McMahon function. So that's it's also interesting. Um, you can see that there's a periodicity. This function is periodic with one in its argument. So the periodicity with tau is tau goes to tau plus three. Okay. And now this function, if you study the singularities, um, uh, it turns out that, sorry. So maybe I'll finish this and then I'll ask again. Um, it turns out that at zero here, there's actually no growth. Okay, so this is, this is the old stuff. And the black hole, because of the supergravity tau goes to tau plus one that I showed you actually lives here. Okay, and it turns out that there is a growth and that's what I'm gonna calculate next. Uh, so this is at the cube root of unity because uh, this, because of what I said, that this, this, this periodic with, with three. Okay, uh, organizer. Say, say again. And this is exactly why I plotted the, the absolute value. Otherwise you'll see the, the phases. Oh, okay, perfect, perfect, then even better. Perfect, perfect, okay. Wait, so after this is technical, okay? So I take this um, double, sorry, elliptic gamma function. Notice for the aficionados that if there were no n here, this is like a modular form, it's like theta functions, but it's like Pochhammer symbols. So this is q to the one minus q to the n to the power n. It's a funny, it's an interesting function which you can analyze. Huh? Plane partitions. Plane partitions, exactly. So it's, it's much higher growth and that's my one over tau square instead of one over tau. And this, it's an interesting question of whether there's a modular or quasi modular or some kind of modular behavior. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you can now, but you don't need any modular transformation. So how do you estimate the growth? So for one over eta, you did a modular transformation. That's, the, that's what we learned, that's what we're taught in school. But in fact, you don't need that. There's a much more elementary way to do this is that take the log of this function, that's an infinite sum and just apply euler maclaurin summation formula. If you do that carefully, you'll just get the asymptotics. Okay, again, if anybody wants a tutorial on that, I can do it outside. Okay, it's, 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 it's very basic. Uh, and what you get is uh, asymptotic growth of this type. Uh, it starts with one over tau square, then one over tau, and then O of one as tau goes to zero. Okay, and the coefficients are functions of Z. Z is the, um, remember here, Z is, is the, sort of the gauge holonomies. These were the eigen angles of the unitary group. Okay, and these are some, uh, something called periodic Bernoulli polynomials. I mean, these are not polynomials, they're piecewise polynomials. They're Bernoulli polynomials between zero and one and then extended periodic. Okay, so this is the Fourier series. Okay, and this B3 is the third polynomial, B2 is the second, second order. Okay, and now you can put all this together and similarly you get a one over tau square, one over tau and one for the whole, integrand of the partition function. And these things are some potentials as a function of the holonomies. And now you have to minimize that. Okay, there's some technical comments I don't want to get into. So you minimize it. You take this leading potential. This is a function of <clears throat> all the differences of the potential. But in fact, if you plot F, you'll see that it has this form. So when all the eigenvalues u, i, j are here, um, you actually get a minimum. That means that <clears throat> ui equals uj. So at the saddle point, all the uij's are zero. 
And then you calculate the leading order potential and you get this function here from these methods. Okay, and that's precisely the F graph equals F graph of tau. Sorry, F black hole. Okay, so there's a one over tau square, one over tau. Uh, so we so here I just did it up to O of one. Maybe on Friday I'll tell you how to move on. Uh, so that finishes one part of the story. So microcanonical and canonical in the Cardi limit. Uh, that that gives a uh, that, that's the proof and the derivation. Yeah, there is no way to study the limit when small n and capital n are becoming equally large. No, that's exactly the, the so n goes as n square, actually. That's the right. Oh, you mean n goes to n linear or n square? So that's the large n limit. That's exactly what I am I'll try to describe on Friday. So that's that's this method applies for finite n. Finite, but now notice that this function is a beautiful function, it's a very simple polynomial function. Just take n goes to infinity. Okay, so that's why it works. Yeah, it's a finite end problem. The only independence arises at small tau. So this is remember this is this is an asymptotic expansion in tau. Okay. So, so there can be other saddles where you also have an asymptotic expansion. That's what will happen. Then the full large n behavior should be the sum of all of those things. Maybe yeah, no. uh, that that is the case. The, the, my question is this: So you took a particular saddle. To get this answer, the subdominant saddles. What is the parameter which controls the L? Again, it's a small. It's a small. So just like tau went to zero, or so. Where was this here? So basically, tau was. This is the asymptotic limit in which tau approaches. You can take some other rational point and approach that, and that's the small parameter. So it's all in the geometry of the S three times S one. But the corrections are one by L. Other saddles. So here it's a finite n asymptotic limit at a saddle. So the kind of formula I'm aiming to write on Friday is kind of a sum over all saddle points. Okay, but then you have to interpret that correctly. Like so, it's 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 actually a sum of asymptotic formula. So that was what I sort of used this for. But but it is true that the dominant saddle point that you're taking has an n squared. Yeah. And all the other saddle points have. N they also have n square. Have there are other saddle points which are also subdominant in n square. I won't even discuss that. There are, but there's an infinite number of saddle points with n square um, growth, but different subdominant uh, things. So in this Cardi-like limit, which is sort of the the one which is relevant to the black hole, this is the now what we, that's exactly what I. I'll skip this thing about n equal to one CFT, and I'll but just. But is order one corrections are one over n or no? No, 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 no. I'm saying this is all finite n, and tau is small. Tau is epsilon or something like that. It's it's okay, a, So this is only a function of tau. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I should. There's no independence inside. No, 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 no. So it's just really it's like this as tau goes to zero. So as tau goes to zero, you have only this. Only the the only independence is here. But there is an order one. That, that means this that it's it's tau is epsilon. So it's one over epsilon square, one over tau, and epsilon to the zero, epsilon to the one, etc. Yeah. So that coefficient has only n square. Yeah. But then the order one comes in this. Yeah. That can have could have, but I'll show you that in fact even that doesn't have. I'll show you on Friday. That we I'm completely 100 percent sure of. I mean, there can be uh, independence of subleading corrections only if those corrections come from, say, uh, some other nearby side. Exactly. So, the, the, the exactly. So, you have to add from this point of view, it's sort of non perturbative in the saddles that gives you the, the n corrections. There, there are other points of view which I'll try to mention in, on, on Friday. Okay. But this is something you can check, you know, both microcanonically, but this, as far as your numerical analysis allows you, you can check this. Okay. It's, it's a very rigorous way of, of doing things. So, so, so I, mean, uh, I, I have a question. Can I ask a question, please? Uh, yes, please. Hi. Uh, so uh, this uh, small uij equal to zero, you said is a saddle point. So the small uij is what? It's the difference of eigenvalues. Yeah, sorry, I should have said that, yes. So if, but in the original path integral over, over the unitary matrix, uh, the measure will have a huge zero, right? 
Ah, good. So that was exactly, wow, I'm very impressed you immediately caught this, but this was exactly this, this comment that the vector, that measure can be put into, I've put it into the vector multiplet. You can just arrange it that way. Um, that has a zero. So what's going on is really this, th thanks Penda for the comment. It's the potential looks like this actually. It looks like this. So if I plot the actual potential, it looks like this. Okay, and then there's a dip. And if it's if you're plotting the log, it goes to minus infinity, but let's like that, okay? But you can do uniform estimates for this. So instead of saying uij is zero, you can make a correct estimate and there's an order of limit issue, but you can completely control this and keep uij here, calculate the potential and then take this gap to zero. Okay, so that, that, that the, the point that you made is correct, but it doesn't affect this estimate. Okay, I understand. Thank so you. So that, that's exactly why. So this we have to work a little hard to show uniform convergence. If you have point-like convergence, then then you don't have this. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so wait, there was one or two more points. This oscillations. I'll show you next. Well, maybe. No, next five thirty. Huh? Self point equation for tau, yeah. It's, it's the same one. The the actual potential. <sighs> that was also just polynomial. Mm, no, I didn't say that. Somebody else might have said, but. Uh, It's all n square. So this I will discuss in again more detail. So this was today. I just want to black. Yeah. No. Okay. It's a little. It's you have to sort of think about it to understand how it works. But roughly the formula is like this. It's the final i n of tau is some sum over saddles of e to the minus the, the thing I've been writing since day one of tau. Okay, and each of these, so alpha will turn out to be some rational number, m over n. Okay, that's my label. And f alpha, f m over n of tau is the following. You write tau minus m over n equals epsilon or tau tilde, tau tilde. And remarkably, this has the same It's just that. The tau tilde is the denominator. Oh, sorry, tau tilde, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's not just that, there's an M here, which importantly, there's an M. So it's like one over M, that's what suppresses the end. It's like the sharp localization in the vector? No, no, so this sum is not convergent, it's not well defined, so, so that's why. It's, so I just can do subtle points at all thing. Now, you can try to do this by other large n methods and then try to compare what happens. And then if you take tau goes to zero, for instance, and ask in those methods, you'll see some one over n corrections. So those must be mapped to the other cells. That's, that's the only thing I said. Maybe that's what you think. Like an asymptotic formula, but yeah. you might say, yeah. 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 Could contribute at the same level as a subleading term in the dominant sign. Like right? If you want to think about it in, in the large. So tomorrow, so the, the way I think about it is you should you're right. So you have to say subleading in what? But then if you qualify it, then it's correct. The way I think about it, you should write the phase diagram in the tau space. Okay, and what will happen next time? You'll see that there's some black hole saddle like that, but there are other saddles. Okay, like that. And depending on where you are in tau, that one will dominate. And that dominance, you can show there's an n square here. You can calculate this completely. And then the last thing I want to say in that line of thinking is that there is a gravitational interpretation of those which are orbifolds of the black hole by some uh, ZM group. Okay, so ZM symmetry. 
Okay, I, yeah, I think it's... So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we can, uh, even some of the other stuff that you have, maybe yeah. we can uh, cover it at the beginning and we'll keep yeah. Friday a little open-ended okay. so as to give you enough time. Okay, good. So first, maybe on Friday, I'll, I'll start again by, you know, somewhere here, somewhere here, and tell you about this cell, tell you about the other cells, face structure, and yeah, then <laughs> there's a few things, like there's some relation to John Simon's theory, or there's this giant graviton expansion. So one or the other I can, can discuss, we'll see. All right.